My name is Dr. Trudy Ufondu of Snowspirations and today it's a very special day. So today we're going to talk about heart diseases. We're going to talk about prevention of heart diseases and we have a very special privilege of having one of the best cardiologists in the world. Um, in the next few minutes, I will welcome our guest presenter. Our guest presenter is Dr. Obiora Maludun. Uh, Dr. Obiora is the Chief Cardiology Fellow at Jesse Shaw University Medical Center in New Jersey. So Dr. Obiora will join me shortly and we'll start immediately. So I'm going to invite Dr. Obiora and we'll start immediately, okay? We're going to talk about things we can do to prevent heart diseases. So. I'm going to quickly introduce Obi, and once everyone is, you know, ready, we're going to start. So Dr. Obi um, schooled in Nigeria um, and went to Nigeria Medical School, practiced in Nigeria Medical School, practiced in the UK, practiced in Caribbean, then finally settled in the US. He's currently the Chief Cardiology Fellow in Jesse Shaw's University in New Jersey. And we have a special privilege of having him <coughs> in our midst to address heart diseases. You see, it's very easy for us to quickly, you know, write off things about our hearts. It's very easy to attach whatever heart conditions we have to the villages. So today, Dr. Obi will have the platform and teach us about the heart. What are the daily things we can do to take good care of our heart? What are those things we are doing that probably might be working against our heart? What are those beliefs, those myths? we probably felt are right, which are completely wrong. So without much ado, I'm going to give the floor to Dr. Obi to address us. Dr. Obi, over to you, please. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm here to give you just a summary of what you need to know about your heart. And just like uh, my brother has said, I was part of everybody back home in Nigeria, and I'm still part of everybody back home in Nigeria. I did my medical school uh, in Nigeria, practiced in Nigeria, and then went to the Caribbean, where I also practiced as a medical doctor from there to the UK, and now in the US. <clears throat> so I specialize uh, in, in the heart, and that's what we call cardiology. So when you hear cardiology, it means the heart. And uh, I'm going to try to uh, use less of medical terms today and use more of lay terms so you'll be able to understand. And I'm going to focus mostly on uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, which is where I started from. And more, most especially for our women, because you guys are very important to us. So I'm going to focus also more on the women. And then I'm going to take questions at the end. And um, if there's any other thing that comes up, we can look at it together. So <clears throat> when we talk about um, cardiovascular health, it's good to understand what the heart does. So the heart is one of the organs in the body and I have the prototype of the heart that I'm gonna show you here and we'll go through that. So what does the heart do? So what the heart does is that it pumps blood to all parts of your body, both to your brain, to your kidney, to your liver, to every part of your body. So it's a very vital organ in the body that if you do not take care of, then the other parts of your body will suffer. So it's good to understand the ways where you're going to take care of this heart. And uh, what I do here mostly in the US basically is to see people who already developed the disease and uh, try to help them in that case. But I want you not to get to that level. So that's why I'm teaching you this. So you don't get to the level of getting that disease in the first place. And there's so many myths out there. Um, like people sometimes may sleep and they don't wake up. And people will say that this is just from the village. You know, these are myths that you hear people talk about a lot of times, and these are not true. So it's good to understand what is going on, so you'll be able to help uh, yourself, and also help your relatives, and make sure that everybody is living healthy. So <clears throat> the heart is divided into four chambers, and I'm going to also show you that. So we have the left side of the heart, which has two chambers, the upper chamber and the lower chamber. And we also have the left side of the heart, which has the left, uh, upper chamber and the lower chamber. So what happens is that there are some blood vessels, which you can see here, supplying the heart. So these are blood vessels that supply the muscle. So the heart is main, made mostly of muscle. So these blood vessels supply the muscles of the heart. 
And if there's any blockage in any of the blood vessels, that part of the heart dies. And when that heart dies, it's not going to be able to do its function. And part of the symptoms you're going to be having when you have this is chest pain. But in mostly in women, they do not have the typical symptoms that maybe men have. So women may have some kind of funny feeling in the chest, in the upper part of their abdomen. They can have shortness of breath. So these are things that um, will let you know that maybe something may be wrong and for you to seek a medical advice. So what happens is that blood comes in through the blood, uh, the veins to the heart, goes to the right side of the heart, from the upper chamber to the lower chamber of the right side. From there, the blood moves into the lungs and gets um, oxygen from the lungs and comes back to the left side of the heart or the upper chamber. From there, it moves to the lower chamber of the heart and then from there, it pumps blood to every part of your body. So, knowing about all this will help us to understand when I talk about heart diseases and all that. So, what are the things that you need to keep your heart healthy? These are very simple steps. They are not uh, 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 rocket science, you know, like people will tell you a lot of big things. These are simple things that you do. I bet you didn't know that 60% of your body is made up of water. And that means that water is very, very important to your well-being as a whole, including the heart. So instead of maybe going to drink beer, going to drink juice and all that, why not just simple thing about water, just drink water, will make you healthy. And I, guess, I bet you didn't know too that even without doing anything, you lose about uh, 1.5 liters from what we call insensible loss from your skin. So even without you seeing any physical sweat, you're losing a lot of water from the skin. This is what we call uh, insensible loss. And even if you do not drink anything at all, your kidney will still produce some urine and this is water you're losing. So when you combine these two things, you're losing at least two liters of water every day. So what your body is telling you is that you need to replace this water. So water is a very simple, very cheap thing that you can do and drink a lot of it. It's going to help you. Drink a lot of it is going to help you. If you can drink at least two liters every day at least, but you can go up to drink up to four liters. That will help you a lot. The other thing that will help you is uh, weight. We, so we have what we call a body mass index and I'm going to just simplify it for you. So, body mass index is something that we use to estimate uh, your risk of having obesity or whether you're obese or not, overweight. So, it's about measuring your weight. So, if you measure your weight in kilogram and then you measure your height, and if you get your height in meter, um, if, if you divide uh, your weight with the height square, you get what we call body mass index. And what we define as overweight is when the body mass index is more than 25, and then obesity is more than 30. Studies have shown, numerous studies have shown, the more your BMI is, the more risk of having a um, heart disease, the more risk of your blood vessel being blocked. Uh, so how can you deal with that? So one of the things you're gonna do is um, being physically active. And when I talk about being physically active, you don't have to always go to the gym. If you can go to the gym, perfect, very good. But um, you don't have to. Some, something simple like maybe instead of using uh, uh, your car to drive to maybe somewhere that is five minutes away, you can just walk down to get that, maybe go to a grocery store and all that. Instead of using an elevator or a lift, just use stairs. So these are simple things that you can do. In fact, the, the World Health Organization has advise that every human being should have at least 10,000 steps in a day. So the more steps you take, the more you improve your, um, your, your heart function. And one good thing about exercise as a whole is that just like people going to the gym and building their muscle, the more you exercise, the more your muscles get, you know, very healthy. And what that means is that as they get healthy, they'll be able to pump blood to all parts of your body without much stress. Because if, if um, they are not able to pump blood easily, then the blood vessels on over over your body, they're gonna become very stiff. And when they become stiff, your blood pressure goes up at the same time. So you have to be very physically active. If you can go to the gym, perfect. So the other recommendation is that you should exercise 
at least 150 minutes per week. So if you divide it like 30 minutes um, per day, it's about five, five days in a week. So if you can do that by just walking 30 minutes, that is perfect. If you can do that by going to the gym and exercising, that is also good. But don't think that you have to always go to the gym. Some simple things can help your heart function well. Simple things, like I said, walking to the grocery, uh, uh, going, uh, using the stairs instead of using uh, elevators and all that. So these are simple things that can help you. The other thing that uh, you have to watch is your diet. And this is where most of us also get it wrong. And you see some people back home in Nigeria. I remember when we were used to, when we were growing up, you see people with large amount of eba, and then they have some <laughs> small soup and maybe maybe small things here and there. You know. So studies have also shown that the higher your carbohydrate intake, the more risk of heart disease you're going to develop. So what I'm saying in essence is eat more of a balanced diet and eat more of vegetables, fruits, legumes, nuts. So these are things that will help you. And these have been shown in studies that if you eat more of those vegetables, that uh, your heart is gonna be healthy. Uh, um, so, and back home, we are blessed with all those things in, in Nigeria because you go to Western world, they eat mostly uh, 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 processed foods and all that, processed food. you know? Mm -hmm. So we are blessed with things in Nigeria that you can actually make your diet very healthy, you know? Um, vegetables Correct. and all that so these are things you should eat more of and in terms of uh, protein if you want to eat protein it's recommended that you eat more of um, 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 plant, protein. plant protein if you can then if you want to really eat animal then fish protein is preferred and if you want to eat uh, do not eat a lot of red meats white meats and lean meats are preferred to uh, red meat so these are things that will help you like salmon fish meats are very very good for the heart they also contain a lot of uh, omega-3 fatty acid, which can also help with the heart. So I've talked about your weight, which doing exercise and your diet can help bring down your weight if it's very high. Um, I talked about the um, diet itself. So you eat more of uh, vegetables, um, uh, fruits, and if you can, please eat them raw. Don't You don't have to go, let's say you want to eat um, orange and you go and buy orange juice, no. Get the real orange itself and drink or eat it the way you want to eat it instead of getting the processed ones. Because one, the processed ones do not have fiber. Fiber is very important in your digestive system. So if you drink the Correct. orange juice, they're going to be absorbed like simple sugars and it's not good for your body. So get the raw one and eat them instead of getting juice. So Because some people tell me that, oh, I'm drinking orange juice, so I'm getting a, a nutrient from it. No get the real one mm -hmm. and not the juice. Correct. <laughs> I remember what I said, 60% of your body is water. It's Drink water. as much Correct. water as possible. Drink, if you did not get anything from what I'm telling you, Today. get this water aspect. Water is very vital to every organ in your body, every single organ. Your brain needs water, your heart needs water, your kidney needs water. Because when you drink that water, you tend to have less kidney stone. You hardly have kidney stone because that water is going to flush out a lot of toxins from your kidney. So you tend to have less kidney stone. And I hear a lot of people having uh, kidney disease back home in Nigeria, kidney failure. This person is on dialysis and all that. These are things that water will prevent you from developing. So drink as much it's water true. as possible. And knowing that we live in a tropical environment where there's so much heat, you should even drink more than even the white people. You know, so drink as much water as possible. Then the other thing uh, I'm going to talk about is exercise, uh, is high blood pressure. So high blood pressure is also one of the things that can make the blood vessels in your heart to be uh, blocked, which can give you heart disease. So make sure you check your blood pressure. Uh, in fact, what is recommended now is that the blood pressure you check at home is even more important than the blood pressure you check in your doctor's office or in the hospital. Because some people may have what we call white coat High, high blood pressure, hypertension, if I may use that. So what it means is that some people, when they come to the hospital, and maybe by seeing a doctor wearing a white coat, their blood pressure goes up high. But normally at home, they are relaxed and blood pressure is fine. So that is why what is more important is to measure your blood pressure at home. Because studies have also shown that if your blood pressure at home is high, you're more at risk of having high um, um, uh, heart disease. 
So if you can, there are a lot of uh, blood pressure machines now nowadays that are very cheap that you can get and keep them at home and measure your blood pressure. And so for blood pressure, we have what we call the upper number and the lower number. So the upper number is what we call the systolic blood pressure and the lower number is what we call diastolic blood pressure. And what is recommended now based on new studies that have come out is that a blood pressure of 120 in your upper number and 80 or less in your lower number is desirable. And the good thing about what I talked about earlier about diet and exercise is that they will help to also lower your blood pressure. So when you are very active, like I said, um, your heart is healthy, pumping blood with less, less stress, your blood vessel will not um, constrict, will not get lower and then give you high blood pressure. So diet and exercise will help in that aspect too. So make sure you get your uh, uh, blood pressure reading. And if it is high, you need to see a doctor to advise you because uh, diet and exercise alone can also actually bring down that blood pressure. So sometimes you may not need medications. Sometimes it may just be simple things that you do that will help bring down the blood pressure. And if you've had a, a maybe a, a relative, first degree relative that died suddenly, don't always think that it's a jazz from the village. <laughs> it may be that the person developed some heart disease that run in the family. So it's good that if you've had that, go and make sure you see a doctor, if possible, a cardiologist that will look at everything for you. Uh, and then make sure that uh, it's not something that runs in your family. Because if it's something, then we can prevent it from getting to uh, where it will it's going to be dangerous for you. Then I'm going to also talk about the one that affects our women, uh, that is diabetes. So diabetes is one of the things that can also predispose you to having a heart problem. And why it's important for women is that if you have diabetes and you get pregnant, there's a lot of risk to your baby. You know, a lot of um, problems, congenital problems that can happen to your baby. That's why it's good to prevent it from happening. So you don't have the diabetes, because if you do have the diabetes and you get pregnant, you have more risk of uh, 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 having, uh, giving birth to babies with some abnormalities and all that. So what do you need to do? What you need to do is to at least check your blood sugar. There's what we call A1C. So A1C is something that checks your blood sugar and tells you how your blood sugar has been for over two to three months. So if you can get that done, good. If you cannot get that done, then what you need to do is what we call fasting blood sugar. What it means is that you fast overnight and then you go and check your blood sugar. And then the doctor will tell you your number and let you know if you have diabetes, if you're at risk of diabetes or if you are okay. But from what I said too, your diet and your exercise can also help you in case you are at risk because uh, overweight or obesity increases your risk of developing diabetes and diabetes means when your blood sugar is very high in the body and like i said this is very important for the uh, for our women because you don't want to be pregnant and then have uh, children that have some abnormalities uh, which i'm not going to go into that at the, at the moment so I have talked about uh, diet, exercise, weight, high blood pressure, and diabetes. Then the other one is also cholesterol. So it is recommended that everybody that is at least above the age of 20 should check blood uh, cholesterol level once a year. So you can go and get a blood test on your cholesterol and then see if your cholesterol is high or it's borderline or it's normal. And like I also said, exercise, diet will help bring down your cholesterol. So that's why I keep pointing towards exercise and diet, because these are simple things you can do that does not require you to spend much money, that does not require you to do like a, a, a rocket science thing, just simple things that you can do to yourself. So if you can right. get anything from what I've said here, three things I want you to get, go home with is water water is number one water 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 drink a lot of water and then number two is exercise be physically active mm -hmm. do not you don't need to if you can but you do not need to go to a gym to do that to so, mm -hmm. so some simple things that you do that increase your activity will help and make sure you make at mm -hmm. least about ten thousand steps in a day all right and then diet what you eat because if you do these things they will first of all also help with your physical well-being and they will help to bring down your blood pressure, help to reduce your risk of diabetes, and also bring down your cholesterol level. Then the Correct. part that also affects, even I see what women doing now also is smoking. 
smoking is dangerous to your health in every ramification. And there's nothing like uh, I only smoke one one stick of cigarette per day or I smoke 10 per packet of cigarette a day. They're all the same. Do not smoke. And if you do smoke, it's better you quit. And also for our mothers too, if you do smoke, you have a lot of risk when you get pregnant for your babies. They can develop a lot of uh, problems. Um, so quit smoking. And the misconception people have is that, oh, I do not smoke, but maybe my friend smokes. There's also what we call secondhand smoking. So secondhand smoking is as dangerous as first-hand smoking. So if somebody around you is smoking, either tell the person to leave or you leave that place because secondhand smoking carries the same amount of risk as somebody who is smoking. So what you can do is either leave that place or tell the person to leave. And that is why you go to most Western world, uh, smoking is banned in public because they don't want somebody else to inhale that smoke because the person has that same risk from the person who is smoking. Um, so I think this is the summary uh, of what we are talking about today. And then maybe if you have any question, then I can be more specific to direct you on what you need to do. Like I said, my major job here is to see people who already developed the disease. So what we basically do is that we go through the wrist or through the groin and from there go through the blood vessel, come into the blood vessel, supply the heart. And if there's any blockage, what we do is that we open the blockage and put a stent. But I do not want you to get to that level. That's why I'm giving you this knowledge because they say knowledge is power. So if you know this, then you prevent um, all these things from happening to you. And also you prevent the stroke because it's the same mechanism. So what happens in stroke is that in majority of the cases, there's a blockage to the blood vessel supplying your brain and you have stroke. And that's why you see some people, they are weak on one side and they will say it's just from the village. It's not just from the village, it's stroke. And these are the same things that predispose you to having heart disease will also predispose you to having a, a stroke. So once you know all these things, you prevent uh, your your body from getting any of these. I don't want you to get to that level. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to take your questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Obi. Um, when I told you guys about Obi, um, he looked like it, like he mentioned the rocket science. So if you notice, what he advised us to do are very simple things. Every day, very simple things. Drink your water, exercise, eat good food, watch what you eat. These are things that add up. Believe in the now. Don't believe in everything you hear in the village. So, Obi, uh, when you were discussing, you mentioned something about cholesterol. Can you break the cholesterol, different types of cholesterol down for Good. Me? Yeah. So, cholesterol, there's a... Uh, for, for, for you guys, I'm going to make it simple. I don't want to use all the terms we use in the medical world. But there's what we call the good cholesterol and the bad cholesterol. Okay? And for you to know that you have to check your blood for those cholesterol. So, if you have a good cholesterol, so what the good cholesterol does is that it removes... Uh, the, the cholesterol from away from your heart and goes to the liver where it's going to be degraded and pushed out of your system or reused for other stuff. Then the bad cholesterol will take the, those cholesterol and deposit it in the blood vessel supplying your heart, in the blood vessel supplying your brain, in the blood vessel supplying every part of your body and cause this uh, problem we are talking about. <clears throat> so it's good to know your good and your bad cholesterol because the good cholesterol will be good for you but the bad cholesterol will be bad for you. Okay, thank you so much. And if I understand correctly from what Obi is saying, when you exercise, there are specific things that happen in your cholesterol level. Yeah. So that particular good cholesterol is the one we actually call the HDL. Mm -hmm. The bad one is the LDL. So it, it's very easy to mix them up. Whatever happens, anytime you're exercising, you're increasing not just the heart, you're increasing everything about the heart. Because if you remember, one of the things Obi mentioned is stroke. So stroke is something that happens, you know, when you don't take good care of yourself. So when you predispose yourself to obesity, when you predispose yourself to smoking and other things you're not supposed to do, you are increasing the risk of heart disease. And the heart diseases are not going to just focus on your heart. It's going to circulate in your body mm -hmm. and affect other aspects of your body. Like one of the habits, Obi, one of the habits we indulge in back home is drinking beer. So every weekend, everybody goes out to drink beer. And beside beer, they drink soda. And the best drink you can have in your life is water. water. So growing up, we drank all those stuff. If you're in your 30s or in your 40s, this is the time to take it easy. 
and go and make sure you protect yourself, especially if you have family. Now, Obi, I'm going to open the floor to give people opportunity to ask questions. That, what, what about the various myths we have back home? Like, if you have heart disease, just take it easy. What do you have to say about that particular myth? About, oh, I have heart disease, so you have to take it easy. Right. Please take it over from Yeah. Me. So, uh, thank you for asking that question. So, that's what we usually uh, uh, have back home. And people will say, oh, you pray yourself out of it. I believe I'm a very good Christian, and I believe that God has given us the human wisdom to do what is right for us. Basically, if you have a heart disease already, then you need to go see a heart doctor who is going to maybe do some tests on you and tell you what is actually, because there are different kinds of heart disease. Like I said, one of them is when the blood vessel is blocked, which gives you heart attack, you know. Then there's also another part where the heart is not pumping very well, which we call heart failure. So, you, like I said, the heart is a muscle and it's supposed to pump blood and it does a lot of work so if it's not pumping blood enough or it's very weak to pump blood then it gives you heart failure so there are different kinds of heart disease but the myth is that you don't have to do anything about it you just pray about it and it goes no it does not it does not you have to do something about it you have to see a doctor who will do uh, some um, test on you and tell you what is actually the problem and gives you either medication or gives you advice on what you need to do to reduce your heart attack or to reduce uh, your heart disease. And like I said, people who have had people who die in their family suddenly without any, any known cause you actually see somebody, see a doctor to look at you because some of these things run in family and there is not what you cast and bind for. <laughs> you can cast and bind to tomorrow, it may not uh, change anything. So it's good you, Correct. Correct. <laughs> it's good you, you, you seek medical advice and then uh, do something about it. Okay, good. Thank you so much, Dr. Obi. Uh, please, if you have questions, please quickly throw your questions out there. Obi, you can see the screen, right? Yeah, I can see the screen. Yeah. Okay, so any of the questions that come up, we'll take care of it. But, you know, let's continue on the myth. So there's this <coughs> other myth that says, oh, it's okay when you're older. If you have blood pressure, it's okay to have blood pressure when you're older. What do you have to say about that? Right. So that is also another myth that people used to say. What happens generally, obviously, is that uh, one of the things that can give you high blood pressure is when the blood vessels, instead of being hard, the normal size they're supposed to be, they get smaller, which we call constriction. So when I mention constriction, it means that the blood, blood vessels is getting stiffer and smaller. So uh, older people tend to have that and increase their um, uh, uh, blood pressure. But studies have shown that even older people, high blood pressure is also not good for them. In fact, there's a, a trial, which I'm not going to bore you guys with, that came out just a couple of years ago, that shows that even in the elderly people, that it's good to maintain a good normal blood pressure. And a blood pressure, like I said, that is less than 120 over 80 is desirable. So the upper number is 120 and the lower number is 80. So even in older people, it's good to uh, make sure your blood pressure is good. Okay, thank you so much. So guys, please remember to throw your questions out there. Once we have any questions coming in, we're going to be tackling them. We are here from the grassroots, so this is an opportunity. <coughs> OB is someone you have to pay a lot of money to have, but we have him free of charge today. So this is an opportunity to milk all the knowledge from this guy. This guy is loaded. Now, OB, the next question goes directly to the dichotomy between women and men. So there's this general belief in Africa that, oh, Blood pressure is an issue about men. It's actually a man's problem. So what do you have to say about blood pressure in the women population, in women? Problem? Yeah, so blood pressure is also, it's even more important. I would say that it's even more important in women than in men. <clears throat> and the reasons, so they did a study also in the United States and they found out that, that women are more likely to die from high blood pressure and high heart disease than men. Uh, part of the reason is also because of this myth that me, women believe that uh, I don't really need to check any of my blood pressure is only for the men and all that. So they tend not to seek medical attention. They tend not also, also not to take uh, uh, um, care of that aspect of their life. So, but like I said, from that study, it shows that women tend to die more from high blood pressure and heart disease than men. And then the good thing about taking care of your blood pressure is that if you, if you have high blood pressure and you get pregnant, there's also more risk of you having what we call the preeclampsia. I'm sure the OBGYN people will know about that. So what it means is that uh, your blood pressure is high, and because of that high blood pressure, your kidney will be leaking a lot of protein, and that can also affect your baby in so many different ways. You can have a, a, a small baby, very small, tiny baby. You can have some different kind of abnormality when you get pregnant. 
and you tend to have more risk of having a lot of swelling in your body. You see a lot of people, apart from the normal swelling, they have more increased swelling due to what, due to preeclampsia. So if you have high blood pressure in women, you are at more risk of having that preeclampsia. So like I said, it's even more important in women than even men. So don't think it's just for the men. It's more important. Women die more because they don't seek medical attention because they think it's a disease of the men. But it's also been shown that in women, uh, high blood pressure is a very, very big problem. So deal with that very well so you don't get to that level. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Obi. It's been an amazing time hosting you on Snow Inspiration. God bless you. So the next question is actually based on... So, sorry, somebody, of... somebody said my BP is 100 over 60. If you don't mind, I'm going to answer that. Uh, she's asking, sure, go ahead. He or she is asking if it should be lower. It's about perfect blood pressure. I don't want it to be too low because if it's too low, um, then you're going to be having dizziness and all that. So blood pressure of 100 over 60 is fine. And somebody said 95 over 65, I think. That's also a very good blood pressure. If your blood pressure is more than that, more than 90 over 60, that's okay, but not more than 120 over 80. So two of you that send these messages, you, your blood pressures are okay, very fine. You don't need to worry about it. But that doesn't mean you will not exercise and you will not eat well. It's also been shown that if you keep exercising and doing well, your blood pressure is not going to go higher than it should be. Correct. Thank you so much, Dr. Obi. So this question is in relation to pregnancy. You know that predominantly my audience are women mm -hmm. and some of them are pregnant. Yeah. So someone is asking about palpitation in pregnancy. What's the role of the heart in palpitation in pregnancy? So palpitation for a common person is the feeling that your heart is racing. So how can you correlate palpitation, your heart and pregnancy? And is there anything they can do to prevent that? All right. So uh, for, for pregnancy, there are a lot of changes that happen in the body. And one of the changes that happen in body, remember your heart is now supplying blood, not just to you, but to the baby. So the heart is doing more work, basically. And there's a lot of um, increase in fluid based on the hormones um, that get um, elevated in your body during pregnancy. So your heart is doing a lot of work. So it's not unusual for some times to have palpitation. The one we worry about is if the palpitation is more frequent than normal. Like say you have a you have palpitation maybe this today and you don't have it again till maybe in two weeks time or three weeks time. What's the why? It's okay because your heart is actually trying to do more work than it, it normally should do. But when it occurs more frequently, that's when you should worry about. And that is when I would advise you to go and meet a heart doctor who is going to do uh, what we call ECG. ECG means electrical uh, pattern of your heart will do the ECG to know if there's something that is really the problem that needs to be worried, uh, uh, to be to be tackled uh, uh, head on. So if you're having it more frequently, it's good to see your doctor and then the doctor can do ECG and then decide what is the best option for you. But if you have it once in a while, it's normal physiological changes that happen during pregnancy because your heart is pumping more blood to both you and to the baby. Yeah, thank you so much, Dopey. Uh, someone is asking, can stress cause heart diseases and blood pressure? Right. So somebody also asked, uh, uh, she's pregnant and she's addicted to Coke. Please, please, my dear, drink water. Stop Coke. At least <laughs> stop drinking Coke. Drink no, water. No. You've drank Coke all your life. You can try water. And the good thing about water is the fact that you can actually flavor your water. Yeah. yeah. There are zero calories flavors out there. You can flavor your mm -hmm. water and you're drinking it. You think you're drinking juice. Yeah, yeah. So please, especially in pregnancy, drink water. Water is the safest thing you can drink in pregnancy. Yeah. So Obi, please, can you give them a feedback on the stress and hypertension and heart disease. Can stress cause hypertension? Can stress cause heart disease? Right. <clears throat> yeah, so stress has also been shown to increase your risk of uh, it's not it's not that it causes it by the way just that it increases your risk so if you have every other thing that gives you that high blood pressure and you now add stress on top of it yes it's going to increase your risk uh, so that is why it's good to sometimes just take it easy sometimes up from from the hustle and bustling of life just take out time and rest take out time and and think about just your, yourself and not think about every other thing. I, I see people, they don't sleep well because they're thinking about work, they're thinking about that. So if you don't sleep well, it's also going to affect your heart. The same way with stress. So 
take our time. And that is why the, the white people have vacation. You know, they have vacation. And we Nigerians don't have that vacation. We don't try to think about vacation. We always think about, oh, I'm going to go this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to go money, make this money, 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 money. But the white people understood. And that is why, if you look at the uh, life expectancy, they tend to live longer than us. And part of the reason is right. because they take out time to rest. They take out time to go on vacation. Um, and even if you don't have money to travel to maybe one island to go on vacation, you can just go to a small place, you know, wherever you are, in the village or whatever. Just take out time and rest, you know, and sleep well. Sleep is very important to, for heart health. Yeah, Obi, a great guy joined us. Who? Cool. So Dr. Ahinza Eke is a regular presenter in my group. Okay. Arinza is a fetal maternal specialist. I'm sure you know Akudo. Yeah, yeah, I know right? Akudo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Ahinza is Akudo, Akudo, Akudo's husband. He's with Harvard. Okay. So Ahinza is asking something about the white coat hypertension. So how can we address this in the audience? How do we prevent it? Yeah. So um, <laughs> it's a big one. So I have to say at this juncture to Arinza that um, studies have shown that white coat hypertension does not. Uh, uh, increase your risk as opposed to people who have high blood pressure and it's on itself so it does not so that's a good part of it and <clears throat> to prevent it for it has to also come from us it depends on for us medical professional practitioners how we relate to our patients like for me when i'm seeing a patient i try to come to their level to make them feel at home because part of what uh, gives that white coat hypertension is when a patient becomes anxious because I'm meeting a doctor, I don't know what's going to happen, I don't know what this doctor is going to tell me or, or that kind of stuff. So it's about us also uh, trying to um, make the patient know that we are human beings, you know, just like they see human beings at home, at workplace and all that, we are human beings. And also for the patient to understand that uh, the doctor is not there to kill you, the doctor is just there to help you. Uh, but like I said, um, in terms of uh, risk, white coat hypertension is, does not have the same risk as, as uh, what we call, so there's a term we call mask hypertension. That is even worse. So mask hypertension means you go to see a doctor, your blood pressure is fine, but you check blood, blood pressure at home and your blood pressure is high. That is even more important than my, uh, white coat hypertension. So white coat hypertension doesn't really confer increased risk to uh, a patient. Yeah, Obi, please, can you dwell more on that mask hypertension? So are there some factors uh, because I know in medical practice, there's something we call Mutapsin syndrome. People mm -hmm. pretend to be sick and, you know, go for leave and stuff. Can you talk to me about that mass hypertension? What are the predisposing factors and how do we identify that among us? Right. So the predisposing factor for mass hypertension are the same factors, uh, part of which I listed here, that uh, predispose someone to having hypertension as a whole. And um, so, you know, so there's a, something we call in medicine, uh, um, where a patient may <clears throat> may present to you and uh, the patient may not have um, uh, or what we call a placebo effect you know somebody comes to you and think oh the doctor has the effect of making me feel well so like i said it can go both ways either it makes you go high or make you go normal um, so that placebo effect that you've seen a doctor so i'm going to see a doctor everything is cool and i'm good and blood pressure may come down to normal but when you go home when you're in your normal state blood pressure goes high. So what's most important is the normal state, what your blood pressure is at the normal state. And normal state is usually when you're at home, relaxed, not doing anything. So that is normal state. That is more important than your blood pressure at a um, doctor's office. So the same risk factors that gives you hypertension, whether at home or in the hospital, will also give you that same risk factors. So dieting, exercising will also help you. Stopping smoking. Smoking can increase your risk of having that. So stopping smoking entirely, entirely. Uh, because I have some friends who will tell me, oh, doctor, I, I stopped from 20 sticks of cigarette to 10 uh, uh, sticks of cigarette. I mean, it's good. It's good you, you kind of cut down, but the best thing is to stop entirely. Quitting oh. entirely is the right. most important thing. So smoking from my little research, because I've done some research on that mask hypertension, increases the risk of uh, having a, a mask hypertension. Okay, thank you so much, Obi, Dr. Obi. Thank you so much. So, what do you have to say about all these, um, you know, prevalence of blood measurement machine at home? Are there specific ways our members should check their blood pressure? Because we have false positive, <coughs> false negative. Mm. So, what can be hypertensive? And uh, probably the way they are tying the cough, they won't check it properly. Or someone can be 
overtly, malignantly, hypertensive, and it's not checking properly, and they will assume everything is okay. So what specific instructions do you need? Do we have any particular level we need to place our hands yeah. when we are checking the yeah. blood pressure? So that's a good one. So one of the things you have to start from is to get the right size of cuff based on your your arm's uh, weight. So it should be about two thirds of your arm. So the cuff you're going to get, because if you use a cuff that is smaller than it should be, it's going to make your blood pressure high. Then if you use a cuff that is far bigger than the two thirds of your arm, it's going to make your blood pressure lower. So first of all, you have to get the right side, which is about two thirds of your uh, of your arm. Then the other thing is that as you're measuring the blood pressure, it's advisable that you rest for like two to three minutes first before you measure. So don't just maybe come back from work and then go straight and measure your blood pressure. It's gonna give you a false reading. So you need to be rested for two, three minutes before you measure your blood pressure. And when you do, make sure your arm level where you're measuring is at the level of your heart because you wanna measure what is obtainable at the level of your heart. So if you put it too high, it's gonna be different. If you put it too low, it's gonna be different. So make sure you're measuring at the level of your heart. So that is what you should aim for. Okay, thank you so much. So at what point, Toby, can we say that someone is hypertensive? Because we, I have so many clients that just check their blood pressure one time and they see 140, 90 and they start freaking out. What is the different level? And how do we check the blood pressure? Do we check it on a particular time? If we check it by 6 a.m., 7 a.m. and we become consistent. How many blood pressures do we need before we can say this person is hypertensive? <clears throat> okay, so based on the definition of hyper hypertension, you need to measure blood pressure at least two times. Uh, <clears throat> people will say at least 12 hours apart to know that you're hypertensive. And the blood Sarah. and the blood pressure reading is uh, it used to be 140 over 90, uh, but now with recent studies, it's been brought down to 130 over 80. Uh, so anything above that is stage one. Uh, so from 130 for the upper level to 140 is stage one hypertension. And then from 140 above is um, uh, uh, stage two. And then there's also what we call hypertensive crisis when the upper level is more than 180. So that one is very, uh, very important that you go straight and get the medical treatment. So when the upper level is more than 180 or the lower level is more than 120, that is also important. So you need to measure your blood pressure at least two times, 12 hours apart. And if it's consistently more than 130 over 80, then you have high blood pressure. Okay, thank you so much, Obi. Um, so relating to fat, some people believe that if you have heart problems, you should be eating little fat as possible. So please, what do you have to say about that? Right. Excuse me, guys, I'm coming. Continue. Right. So, um, so in terms of fat, so there's what we call the uh, saturated fat, which you find in most of the oil that we use. And there's what we call the unsaturated fat. So if you want to eat like oil and all that, then olive oil is one of the things that has been shown to be better in terms of your heart, unlike the other aspect of oil that we eat. So if you're going to eat, first of all, you should distribute the fat level of whatever you're eating. Don't eat as much fat as you would want to. Uh, but uh, eat more of um, unsaturated fat, more than sat um, saturated fat. So that's the recommendation. Okay, thank you so much, Obi. I'm actually, you know, heating on the meat. Um, it looks like our members are dead. They're not bringing out questions. So uh, let me ask you this one. If you have smoked for years, mm -hmm. you can actually reduce the risk of heart disease by frequency. Yeah. And I believe you've already touched on mm -hmm. that. Okay, so a small heart attack is no big deal. A small heart attack is no big deal. These are me. Mm -hmm. So please, what do you have to say about that? So a small heart attack is a like big deal. Is is big whatever they call small heart attack is big deal because it may potentially there is a danger of even a bigger one coming up next time. So if you if you have a small heart attack, like say you're walking and you have chest pain, it's something that tells you that something is wrong with your heart. So you should go and seek medical attention. So even if you call it a small heart attack or big heart attack, to me, they are the same. Because even if it's a, it's a small heart attack, you have higher risk of having a bigger one that may lead to death. So even if you have a small heart attack, don't take it lightly. Take it seriously. Go see a heart doctor and get treated for that. Yeah, thank you so much. So I'm not going to come to women's health because I'm predominantly, you know, into women's health, maternal and child health. So uh, what advice? 
will you give to our going to conceive women? So our going to conceive women are women that are desirous of becoming mothers. Mm -hmm. Some of them have long-term infertility. What advice do you have to give our women in regards to things you need to do before you think of becoming pregnant? Please go ahead. Okay, so I'm going to take them one after the other. One of the first things you should do, like I said earlier, is to stop smoking because it affects you, it affects the baby in so many different ways. So stop smoking entirely if you plan to keep birth. Uh, you don't want to bring a child to this world who has one kind of uh, problem because of what you did. You know, it's something that, you know, the child is going to live for forever. So if you have the best interest of that child at heart, stop smoking. That's one thing. Then also make sure that if you're on the higher side in terms of weight, that you try to be more active. Because if you're more active, then you're going to be able to carry your pregnancy very well without much complications than if you're more sedentary. Then also watch what you eat, because what you eat will also affect the baby. Just like the person that I was talking about, that uh, there's some, somebody that said that she drinks Coke every time. You, you're taking a lot of sugar into your system. And guess where most of them are going? They're going to the baby too, right? So, so if you're overweight or if you're obese, it's something good that um, you should try to lose that weight because increased weight, as you guys will also know, uh, decreases your fertility level, you know? <clears throat> but if you lose weight, you tend to uh, take in more than if you are very big, obese and all that. So aim to lose weight, aim to eat right and drink plenty of water. So these are things you're going to do. And if your blood pressure, if, you, if your diabetes is very high, then you may need to be on medication. So make sure these are treated very well because if not, then you have a lot of uh, consequences. Like let's say somebody is diabetic and, and did not uh, treat diabetes and gets pregnant. Like I said, there are a lot of congenital abnormalities, which I mean, they can tell us more about. There's also increased risk mm -hmm. of um, having a baby that is too big, you know, and these are macrosomia. macrosomia. So these are problems. So make sure you are in good health because you're going to house a life inside you. So if, if you as a person carrying that house, uh, that, 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 that life is not healthy, then it means that life may not be healthy. So if you have the best interest of that life in you at heart, make sure before you get pregnant that you make sure that everything about you in terms of health is intact before you get pregnant so you don't have any problems. Yeah, thank you so much. One of our members is asking what weight should one have before pregnancy? and during pregnancy. So using the body max index mm -hmm. you mentioned, yeah. which is very easy to calculate, mm -hmm. what is the advisable weight for a woman that is intended to become pregnant? And what is advisable weight when you're pregnant? And I said, please, if you're there, you can also chime yeah, in. Yeah, I think Irene's the kind of time in there, but uh, from a cardiovascular aspect of it, um, <clears throat> uh, BMI, like we talked about, is get your weight uh, in kilograms, okay? And maybe get your height also in meters, and then, Square your, say, say your, your, your height is two meters. I'm just using that as arbitrary number. Say your height is two meters. Okay, so you're going to do two square, which is four. All right. And say your weight is um, 100, 100 kilograms. I'm just using that also as an arbitrary number. So it's going to be 100 over four. And if you divide that, that's 25. So that's your BMI. So you get your weight in kilogram divided by your, your height in meter squared. And that will give you your BMI. So desirable is for you to be less than 25, if possible. Between like 19 to 25 is the, is the optimal, if you can. I know maybe some people may not, but uh, <laughs> make sure you do not get to the obesity level, which is more than 30. That one is not a good one at all. But the optimal Odi, is between Odi, 19. How many of us? <laughs> how many of us have 25? Come on, give me no, a So that's why I said that. That's why I said that, that at least aim not to get more than 30. I mean, I can give some people a leeway of maybe more than 25 but once you get to 30 it's something for you to really <laughs> think about yeah, people like us that, that's a good one that's a good one so obi someone is asking us to you know kind of give uh, what are the signs of heart attack good so that's a good question and i'm going to answer that in a typical way and atypical way and just to also buttress my point that women present in atypical way so which we call atypical symptoms so the typical cardiac uh, heart attack symptom is maybe you're walking and then a crushing chest pain comes at the center of your chest or the left side of your chest. And that pain relieves when you rest and starts again when you walk or when you exert yourself. You know, so this is the classical presentation. 
chest pain that occurs on exertion that is um, behind your heart or behind your sternal, and also relates when you rest. So that's typical. But women being unique creature, and which I like them about, is that they present with atypical symptoms. And those atypical symptoms, instead of them coming with uh, maybe chest pain, some of them will call with upper abdominal pain instead of chest pain. Sometimes it may be with uh, shortness of breath. Maybe they walk some distance that normally a normal person for breath. They are already short of breath. Uh, sometimes it may be that they, they, they walk and they start sweating a lot. So these are atypical symptoms that heart attack can do to understand that as a woman, when you are having all these symptoms that occur when you walk, you go, should go and check it out and make sure it's not a heart attack. Okay, thank you so much. So Obi, please, what do you have to say about the intake of supplements? So is there any role for some supplement in regards to preventing heart attack? So for us, cardiovascular-wise, we've done a lot of research on supplements and found out that there is no proven uh, uh, benefit of supplements. So I, I personally think that most of these drug companies are just stripping people off, telling them, buy this, buy that, buy this, and all that. So studies have shown that none of those supplements have any effect. They have neutral effect to your cardiovascular health. So they do not. That's my summary. Okay. So things like beta carotene, vitamin E, C, is just it, all facts, It's just all right? facts. There, there's no scientific basis for them. No scientific basis at all. Okay. 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 Thank you so much. So what do we have to say about, you know, babies that are born with heart diseases? Because I remember <coughs> growing up, one of the best soccer players in Nigeria, Kano Wampo, mm -hmm. um, went to play in England mm -hmm. and then uh, he fainted and they discovered he's got some, you know, congenital cardiac disease. So please, can you tell us anything about that? Right. So some of these things, like I said, is based on what the mom did when they were pregnant, like I said. So that's why it's good for the mother to make sure you're in good health before you, give, you even think of carrying a baby. Because what you do before carrying the baby can affect the baby. And once the affect the babies for the life of that baby so it's good prevention they always say it's better than cure right and like i said here mostly in the u.s i do more of uh, cure but uh, it's, prevention is the most important thing. is the primary thing in fact primary care is the most important thing so if you can prevent it happening in the first place then that is the ultimate but say you were not able to prevent it based on uh, your lifestyle not being the right um, uh, lifestyle and you give birth to the baby so I also work with, um, in fact, one of my co uh, colleagues here is into um, congenital heart disease, people, kids who are born with um, heart problems and all that. So they need to also be followed up because some of them, if they are repaired on time, uh, the person can have a normal life. So sometimes people are born with hole in their heart. Like I told you about the uh, four chambers in the heart, right? So the, the, the right side and the left side, there is a, a, a kind of a wall that separates two of them. So some of the kids are born with holes communicating between the right and the left side. So some of those can be closed. And we actually do close it, um, uh, not even with open heart surgery these days. We can go through the groin or through the wrist and close the hole if possible. And that can make the child live a normal life. So if you do have that, it's good you seek medical attention for your child and make sure it's treated before it gets too late. Uh, because that is how some people maybe doing exercise, some of them can die based on one thing or the other. So it's good you take care of that. But prevention, like I said, is better than cure. So live a healthy life before you think of having a baby. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Obi. It's been an amazing time. Now this will be more of on the concluding side. So is it possible to treat hypertension completely? Is hypertension treatable? Are heart diseases treatable? Because people believe, oh, I used to have hypertension, then I got treated and completely I don't have hypertension. So what do you have to say about hypertension in regards to treatment and things like diabetes? All those chronic conditions. So, so that is why these are called chronic conditions and not acute. It means that you're likely going to live with it for the rest of your life. Um, but like having said that, I've seen some people who, um, based on living a healthy lifestyle, have tried to bring down their risk. And I actually have a patient uh, that I saw in the clinic the other day that I'm monitoring right now without medication. The patient was on medication. So it's possible that you may not be on medication, but you still have that 
diagnosis is a chronic illness and it's a chronic disease that you're going to live with. So do not stop any of your medication by yourself. Let it be your physician that advised you to stop that based on a lot of other factors that the physician must have seen. Uh, maybe um, find out that the blood pressure medication is making your blood pressure too low and all that. And then uh, it's most likely to be um, treated with um, and uh, um, diet and exercise and all that. So the summary is that it's a chronic illness. You're likely going to live with it, but uh, don't stop your medication unless advised by your doctor. Okay, thank you so much, my brother. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, just to wrap up, uh, uh, there's a question from Ezinde Abini. Uh -huh. She said, some people fall outside the bracket of normal BMI in terms of muscles long bones and they still remain healthy yes. what do you have to say about that and that is right and <clears throat> in fact part of what the study we want to do basically uh maybe by next year is to actually come to africa and uh, nigeria specifically and check people's bmi and see their risk because i personally also believe that sometimes the numbers we use here in america and in the western world may not be applicable to us back home in nigeria so some people if you're going to have um high bmi let it be due to muscle mass than fat, you know, because we know what is muscle and we know what is fat, right? So if you're going to have higher BMI, let it be due to muscle and not uh, fat. So that's a very good point. So I believe that maybe we should also get our own numbers back home in Nigeria and in Africa as a whole. Yeah, thank you so much, my brother. We have just a few more minutes. Um, since we don't have any other new questions from the audience, please, what's your general advice to Snowspiration subscribers? <clears throat> what are you telling them on this day in regards to prevention? Because one of the habits we have back home is treatment. Mm -hmm. So we want to wait for something to happen and we're very easily mm -hmm. carried away. We walk to the pharmacy, we buy stuff, we don't have regulation. What do you have to say about prevention <clears throat> and clinical treatment of disease? Mm -hmm. Which one should come top on our list? Which one should we play, play more emphasis on? Right. So, so prevention is paramount is paramount it's better like i said earlier to prevent something from happening than when it happens to now start taking the uh, medication and let us also stop this habit of going to a pharmacy shop and just oh i have this i have this just mix medication for me mix something for me that is not the right way to go about it uh, remember that medications have their side effects so you don't know the side effect of the medication you're taking and that is why it's good if you can prevent that thing from happening in the first place, it's good to prevent that from happening uh, because uh, medications have their side effects. So um, try to prevent it from happening in the first place. That is the most important thing. And that's what we try to teach to our patients these days that if you prevent something from happening, then you don't have to take medications because medications have their side effects. There's no medication in this world that does not have a side effect. There is no medication. And I can tell you that with certainty. Having practiced many years in the world, different parts of the world, there's no medication without side effects. So the less medication you prevent yourself from taking by taking care of yourself prior to having that disease, the better for you. So prevention is the most important thing in, in, in medicine. Uh, thank you so much. I'm going to ask one more question, then we'll wrap up. Uh, do we have a role for post-mortem, for autopsy, in regards to finding out if all those people that died suddenly, that went to the village, then they came back and they died, and they were contesting for a land in the village. <laughs> What's the role of autopsy in, you know, diagnosis and treatment of heart conditions? Please go ahead. So it will interest you to know that majority of the advances that we have in medicine are based on autopsy, based on people who died. And that is where the white man is kind of different from us back home in Africa. Because, you know, in Africa, we have this um, this mentality that if somebody dies, they don't touch anything and all that and all that. So, but it, I, it, I think it's good if you can start that. And what it does is um, somebody has already died, right? So you're not going to bring the person back. But you can do something. And what you're going to do is to prevent other people in that family or in that lineage not to die from the same problem. You know, if somebody, something kills somebody and then you're able to use that to prevent other people from dying, you've done a lot because, like I said, you're not going to bring the other person back. The person has died. So, say, I'm going to give you an example. There's a disease we call uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. What it means is that the heart, you know, there's a thickness of uh, your heart muscle. And in some people, and it runs in some family, uh, the heart muscle becomes too thick, very thick. 
And what it does is that those people have a risk of sudden death. You, somebody may just be uh, maybe playing basketball or playing football and then die suddenly. You know, so those people have that risk. So if you're able to detect it based on somebody who died and then know that this person, this thing can pass, can be in the family and you're able to detect it in people who are living, you can advise them on what to do to prevent them from dying. But, you know, back home, we just believe that, oh, somebody has died, just leave the person. If you can, if you can, really, I think it's, it's, it's usually a good thing if somebody dies suddenly to find out what happened. It's not always jazz, my brothers and sisters. <laughs> it's not It's not always from the village. <laughs> you know? I know. You know, so it's just yeah, this awareness. I recently had a classmate that, you know, went to the village. He's a lawyer, mm. so he came back and he slumped and died. Mm. And the first theory was that there was a man he was contesting <laughs> a case in the car that uh, uh, yeah. and we have so many of those yeah. people out there so um thank you for coming my brother and just before i wrap up dr obiora is a very very good guy he's a brother he's a colleague he's a friend and i i know i have so many brothers like people are from nigeria you're my brother but this guy is a brother he's a cousin so I know him and uh, this is just the beginning of a whole lot of things to come. So he will be coming back to talk about a couple of other things, but it's a very big privilege and we thank you for spending time for the last one hour to teach us. We appreciate you and God bless you. And uh, I had wanted to see my little uh, niece, and niece, uh, niece and nephew, but Obi is in the hospital right now. So subsequently, we'll come back and then uh, we'll continue talking because medical issue they have in Africa is not a one-time thing, it's a continuous process. Mm -hmm. And if each and every one of us that trained in Nigeria, practicing outside Nigeria, can spend at least one hour every day in a week to teach, we will not have any problem in Africa. So whenever we see one of us coming back to give back, it's a thing of joy. So Obi, I appreciate you a whole lot. Oh, thank you for and, having me. Um, thank you for coming. and. Just know you're gonna come back. Obviously, this is not the last. Mm. We'll invite yeah. you back, yeah. and then we'll keep talking and we'll keep improving on what we started. Until we see you again, thank you so much. If you have a last minute word, you can go ahead and share with now then. All right. Um, I want to say that uh, no matter that I'm here in America, I'm part of you guys back home in Nigeria, and uh, Nigeria is in my heart forever. You know, you can't take that away from me, and that is where it all started. And I want you, I, I join you to keep listening to Snow Spiration um, because um, I noticed that we do more a lot about preventive medicine here, which is the most important thing, like I said. So uh, keep doing the good work and um, keep doing all you're doing and live healthy. And remember, if you did not get anything from this talk, drink plenty of water if you can. And that is the secret to a good health. Yeah, Obi, thank you so much, and uh, God bless. We'll invite you back, and God bless you, my regards to the people. All right, take you. care. See, if we all come together, if we all use our resources together, thank God for social media. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter the challenges you have. If you keep doing the simple things, simple things over time will make things better. But if you keep focusing on quick fixes, you know, you want to cut corners, you keep having problems. So. Snowspirations is out here to serve. Snowspirations is out here to educate. So we want to make things better. So we are, we've touched on nephrology, we've touched on cardiology, we've touched on infertility. We'll keep developing content. So every day you show up on Snowspirations, you're going to be getting the best. And these are us. Everybody I'm talking about are people that went to Nigeria, people that you know studied there, people that practiced there. So they're among us. So our hearts are home. We belong to Nigeria. We can't run away from Nigeria. So thank you for coming this afternoon. And uh, I will be back and I'll communicate with you guys. But until I see you guys again, God bless you and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Bye-bye for now.